don't know, that's one of our groups, amen? If you notice the background, that was right up here. I uh, happened to record that on my iPhone about two years ago. It's amazing when you never know when you need something, amen? And every time I look at it, it's still, it's amazing the, uh, the talent that we have. We got people in other places right now, but... You know, don't, don't think for a moment that we don't have talent at Maranatha because we got plenty of it. And uh, we, will, we will be back in full form pretty soon. So you just rest assured. And sometimes, you know, Elder was talking about the fact there was no music. Sometimes we need the quiet. Sometimes you just need to sit <coughs> and meditate. But the thing is, we can't really do that anymore. You know, we, we hustle and we bustle and we run. As soon as we sit down for a second, next thing we know it's two hours later because we done fell asleep. So we really need that quiet sometimes. You know, we, uh, we, 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 our senses are just always so, I don't know about you, but I've, I've, I've made it a point to my wife to tell you, I, I'll get me a nap any time I can these days because you never can tell you, get, you need another one. But in any event, let's get started this morning. Thank you for coming to Maranatha this morning. As I always say, you had a choice to be anywhere, but we're glad you're here with us this morning. We're glad that you're here with us on Zoom. We've got we to pick up from where we, we, we finished last week. We were talking about seeking the original. And if you remember, I was talking about the fact that, you know, I hate remakes of songs and how the remake was taken away from the original. And, and, I, and I talked a little bit about the, the process I went through to, to, to make a cassette, how I, I was trying to, just see, to let you see how you know, how labor-intensive and love-intensive of making something is. And I, I failed to mention that I made cassettes for my beautiful wife when we were, going, we were dating. Matter of fact, we still got some of those tapes, believe it or not. 35 years later, those tapes still work. Why? Because I got a quality tape at the time, and I took time to do it, and as well. And we also talked about the fact that we used to write letters. You know, one staying on mom and dad's phones all night, we, we had to write letters. And then we made the analogy that, you know, although I took my time and I put my love and my effort into a, to, the, to the letter, that somebody else, some kind of way, got my letter. And then took my letter and took the words I had and misled somebody with them. And then we talked about the fact that, you know, more than one person got a hold to the letter, and they mis misconstrued some words, and they used it. To, be, to lead people astray. All that to get to the point that we were saying, God is not happy because we have taken his word in a lot of cases and misconstrued it. And we went on talking about the difference between the original and we talked about what God said versus what man said. And then we got to the, got to the end where we were talking about the Bereans. And although the Bereans, they, they, they took the words that were said, they just didn't take it to heart. They took back and they, they went back and they um, compared them to the scriptures. And then we went a little bit further because I asked, asked the question, I said, how did they do that? Because we figured out through study that, A, nobody had Bibles in their houses. So what were they comparing them to? So we, we figured out that being Jews that they memorized the first five books of the Bible. And remember, there is no New Testament yet. They memorized the Old Testament. So they put, they took what they knew from the disciples and they applied that to their knowledge. Not only that, they met in groups like we're doing now, Sabbath school and church. They met in groups and they discussed the scriptures. They didn't argue. They just discussed the scriptures. They brought teachers in and they brought, brought, brought people in that helped them come to an understanding. And then they decide whether they're going to take it to heart or not. Just didn't take it to heart. So now we're in a place now today that got people telling us all kind of stuff. So we got to be careful to keep up, to keep our eyes and, 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 our, and our hearts focused on the original. So we're going to keep on this morning. Continue to seek the original. Amen. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we're thankful this morning. You brought us together another time, Father. And if the song says that you never do another thing for us, we're just thankful that you brought us this far, Father. Bless us as we go into your word. Bless those who are here. Bless those who are on Zoom. Bless those who are struggling in the valley of indecision uh, just to whether to come back to church or not, Father. We actually reach out to the ones that we can't reach, Father. 
bring us all back together. You said there are sheep not of this fold. We understand that. But we also want to make sure that we're taking care of the fold as well. We thank you. In the name of your son, Jesus Christ, amen. Our scripture for today is John 14, 18 through 11. And Philip is having a, 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 a challenge with Jesus. Now, it's, it's amazing that these guys have been with Jesus all this time, and they're still asking some of these questions that you would think that they would know. But we'll, just, we'll follow the scripture to see where we get this morning. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. So Jesus had to say, look, I've been here the whole time. You've been looking at me. How do you say you don't know me? Everything he does, I do. And matter of fact, the things I do are because of what he told me to do. I don't do these things on my own. So he's glorifying the Father through his actions. We're talking about Father's Day coming up tomorrow. I appreciate my father. Didn't always preach a sermon. But the man got up at 4 o'clock every morning and went to work. The man made sure that we had a roof over our head and food on the table. The man made sure the things that we needed, we had. And he even had a little time to play. Those are the things I learned. It wasn't a sermon per se in voice, but it was a sermon in what I supposed to do. You know, you, 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 your fathers, they did that. They made the sacrifices. Sometimes he was dog tired. Still had enough time to try to, try to, try to play a little game with us or whatever. Also taught us how to be better men. Taught us how to have a side hustle. All my brothers got side hustles. We painted. We did all kinds of stuff. But we, he didn't tell us per se. He just showed us the way. And he explained to us why he was doing that for us. Good fathers do that. I appreciate my father-in-law. In his own right, he went from, from the streets of, uh, of a poor situation in Charlottesville, Virginia. Ended up retiring as a major in the United States Army. Went through OCS the long way. Now he still works for the government. So I have two, two very effective role models in my life that, that showed me the integrity and hard work. And I'm sure you got them too. And then there were the guys in the neighborhood. I didn't want to get caught up right now, but I guess I'll do it. I had, guy, I had, I had fathers of other, uh, of other uh, friends of mine poured into me. Matter of fact, they poured into all of us. Do well. Go to college. Do these All the things that they did not get to do. They were encouraging us to do. Amen. Good fathers do that. Philip was saying, you know, but Philip was talking to Jesus. And Jesus said, look, you can't tell by the things that, that are happening that the father is not working in me. I remember when I first started going out and doing things. And you guys know. The last thing you want to do is bring reproach on your family. So you didn't get out in my neighborhood and start acting like you didn't have no sense. Because if it got back to Bobby Joe Davis, it wasn't no place I could hide. Because I brought reproach on him because he taught me better, but I decided to do something that was contradictory. Folks would judge him. Y'all know who y'all are. You'll judge him by the things that I do. So I wanted to make sure I represented my father well. And Jesus here is representing his father well. That's why he was, Peter, he was acting, Philip, you don't understand what's going on? The only thing I do is glorify my father, amen? Any good father prepares as much as he can for his child's well-being. So we give honor to the fathers today. We talked about those. And I talked about my neighborhood dads and their friends. And it's interesting that my parents called me one day about three weeks ago, four weeks ago. And they said, Calvin came by the house. I said, Calvin? Calvin who? They said, you remember Calvin about 40 years ago? I said, yeah, oh, yeah, I remember now. They said, yeah, he came by the house. We hadn't seen him in I don't know when. But he, he, he came by and he, and he thanked us for the love that was shown to him as a young guy when he was hanging around with us because he wasn't getting that anywhere else. Forty years later, he appreciated what was done. The effects that we have on people now, come on with me. Especially in the lives of children, they will remember those things. Brother Cameron, he works with distressed situations he, on a daily basis. He sees kids that need love, amen? But we all do that too, but he sees, those things. He sees what families are going through without a lack of a father. A positive father figure in the situation. 
But he came by and, and he thanked him. And I was trying to, I'm still trying to get in touch with him because I ain't talked to him in 40 years. I appreciated him. But you know, one of the things Ellis Office was the most moving thing for me. Of all those neighborhood fathers, I've had the honor yet, a sad honor, of sang at a couple of their funerals. I've officiated a couple of their funerals. Even preached at one of their funerals. So it's amazing how time turns sometimes and we have to end up doing things that we necessarily don't want to do, but we do them in honor of those who've done so much for us. So life is interesting sometimes. But we have to maintain and we have to continue to be a positive influence in the lives of our children, amen? And not just our children, all the children we come in contact with, amen? Be that positive influence. So Jesus is dealing with, with Philip, and, and Philip and these guys are supposed to know this, but Jesus spent all of his time on earth here promoting his father, amen? He didn't take credit for nothing, nothing at all. Even from the young age of 12, he told his mom and dad when they were trying to look for him, he said, don't you know? That I'm about my father's business? Are we about our father's business? Is they not just the one on earth? But are we about our father's business? Are we doing the things that we need to do to make a positive impact on other people and show the love of Christ as we go along, amen? Talk about keeping our eyes on the original. But let's use the scripture to see what Jesus did. We're not going to be alone, but we're, not, we're not also not going to be here without going through scriptures, Amen. Let's go to John 1, 8, John 1, 18. It says that no man has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is the bosom of the Father, has declared him. So Jesus declares the Father, amen? So we keep our relationship with God the Father and the Son intact by simply declaring our faith. We do that every Sabbath. For God so loved the world that he gave who? It's only begotten son. If he was his son, he is his father. Amen. That whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Now, this is the kicker right here, verse 17. For God said, not his son. And to the world to condemn. He didn't send him here to wreck shop. He sent him here to try to save us. Where did it get so construed that we serve a vicious and a terrible God that's a mean God? God is nothing but love, Old Testament and New Testament. Now, he had to do some things for the sake of sin. He didn't do them because he wanted to. Do you realize when we go to heaven, those that make it, there's going to be a group that's not going to heaven. God is not going to take any pleasure in doing what he has to do to them because, believe it, he's given them all the time in the world. He said, look, if you do this, then this will happen. If you don't do this, then that will happen. So, but it's still, he's going to have a tear in his eye, but he's going to wipe the tears away from ours. When you scraped your knee and, and your mom or your daddy came out there to get you, what did you do? Cry. And what did they do? Comfort you. Now, did that necessarily make the knee feel better right then? But the fact that you knew you had somebody that you could go to when you're in trouble. I remember a time I, I, I stayed at home longer than I should have. Went by my brother's house and started hanging out. Left my little town in 96. Y'all might not know where 96 is, but little town. I was headed back to Columbia. Got down to the traffic circle down there on the bottom of It's 1 o'clock in the morning. Nobody out there. I run up. I hit a dog in my car. I was scared and didn't know what to do. Finally, I, 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 was, I was able to make it to the little store. The store didn't have nothing. Back then, we had pay phones, so you know how long this has been ago. <laughs> pay phones. So I called. First thing I did, call 911. Told the man I had a wreck. Then I called my dad. Cop came by. And he said, oh, I know it's a deer. You hit a deer. You can't wreck your car like that and not hit a deer. I said, well, let's go see. He said, well, he said, let's go see. So I'm in the cop's car with him. We're riding back up the road. And we, long story short, we found the biggest St. Bernard I'd ever seen in my life. I'd hit that dog. So he took me back to where the car was. And he said, well, you know, I, I could, I can't take you to Columbia, but I can, I can sit here with you until somebody comes. So lo and behold, my father, who had just got back from a singing, a singing engagement, he 
My father, a quartet singer, he, sing, he used to sing all around the country. He had just got back, I think. He got in the car from 96, came to get me, took me to school, dropped me off, and was back at work at 4 o'clock that morning. All this was in a matter of two. That is what? And what did he say? Did he scold me? Now, I heard some words later. <laughs> but at the time, it wasn't the time. He was making sure that his son was all right. That what Jesus, he's making sure we're all right. But there will come a time if we're not straight that he will scold us. He has to. Because who he loves, he chases. Now, who likes getting whooped? All the whoopings I took in my life, I never liked never, never one of them. Especially when he said, God, go take a bath. You know how it feels to sit in a hot bathtub with a whip on your back. They love us. God loves us, but that love comes with responsibility. It's like he told Cain, he said, if you do well, you'll be okay. But if you don't do well, what lies at the door? Sin lies at the door. The father was just trying to tell him, look, there are some responsibilities I have, but there's also some responsibilities that you have. Amen? So let's go to John 14, 6 to 11. Talking about the relationship between the Father and the Son and how we need to keep our eyes on the original. Amen. Jesus said unto him, I am the unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto who? The Father, but by me. So I don't know all these people saying we got all these different ways we go to get to heaven. But this is Jesus talking. You would think if anybody knows how to get to heaven, it is the man who left it, amen. So what did he say? No man goes to the Father but by me. So if anybody tells you any way else to heaven, and I'm not trying to be facetious, and I'm not trying to be smart. It is just here, amen? Amen. Now he says, look, if you had known me, you should have known my Father also. So now we got our identity crisis. We claim to know Jesus, but do we really know Jesus? And if we really know Jesus, do we know the Father? Do we know the relationship that they have? Because if we don't know the relationship they have, it's kind of hard for us to develop relationships with each other, amen? Father, son, sister, brother. It's kind of hard to develop those relationships because we don't understand the relationship between God and Jesus. Here goes Philip again. This is, this is the uh, first part of that um, this is, this is the next part of that situation. Philip is still, Philip is still, this is right before Philip asked the question. He says, Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, it has sufficed us. Now, Jesus just told him in verse 6 who he was. He had just told him in verse 7 who he was. It didn't click with Philip. There's a term, and I don't, it's, I, 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 I just glanced at it a minute ago, a little before I got up here. But it's, some, it's, 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 it's dealing with satiation. I don't know if I said that right, but what it is is that we've heard something so many times that we just blank out. So we've heard about the second coming, and we've heard about Jesus is the way, the truth, and the light. We've heard about Daniel and all this other stuff, but we've heard it so much that we've started to blank out. This is how the very elect is going to get fooled. Because we've heard it so much that we've stopped taking it to heart. But when we take it to heart, it's going to be too late. That's why the scripture said that our hearts are going to fail us. Not because we didn't know the truth. Why are we going to be lost? Because we did not love the truth. I know my wife. Now, if I just said I hurt my wife every, every day for the 33 years that we're married, I know you. You think she's going to be happy with that? At some point, that knowing has got to turn into something else. I have to show my love for the situation. And how do I show my love for the truth? I respect the truth. I live the truth. I follow the truth. I teach others to do the same thing, amen? You would think that through a lot of shared experiences and personal time, Philip and the rest of the group would have had a rock-solid faith. We talked about that before, too. But we found that wasn't the case. 
Jesus even said, at least believe in the things that you've seen. And you guys remember that little test I gave y'all to take home? Some of y'all that were in the sanctuary, the ones that talked about the four temperaments. And then it had another one that talked about the other, the other part of the test. It was, a, it was visual and, and kinetic and, and, um, and auditory. Most people, unfortunately, or fortunately, as we're going to see in a second, most people are visual. That's why you wear different color clothes. That's why your car, you take your cars to the car wash and, and, and make sure they got armor all on the tires. I do the same thing. I, I'm, I'm not criticizing. I'm just telling you that's why we do what we do. That's why TV and media and all that stuff has such an effect on us because it catches our eye. Studies say that, you know, we could process 60,000 different images in a short period of time if we see them. We could only process a little bit, probably 20% of what we see, if we read. And unfortunately, we only remember 10% of what we hear. That is, that is the thing that we have to be concerned about because although God is a visual God, because remember he says, eyes have not seen, or ears heard, the wonderful things. When he, when he talks about things, when he talks about Eden, he talks about how beautiful it is in heaven and how beautiful it is. All these things are visual. He wants us to create the vision in our, in our minds, but he puts a little caveat in the Bible that hopefully we can grab onto. It says we walk by faith and not by sight. Matter of fact, what Jesus said, when he comes back, there's going to be some people trying to fool you. They're going to say he's here and he's there. But if we get caught up in the visual, and everybody is a little bit all of them, but most people are visual. If we allow our physical eyes to dictate us, that's when we get in trouble. That's why we, we take our eyes off the original. Because our relationship with Christ is a spiritual relationship, not a physical one. Jesus came as a man, and, and the scripture says that he was comely. I mean, homie. Like, he didn't want nobody would be able to say, just pick him out and say, I'm going to follow him because he looks good. But you remember that was the situation with Saul. He was head and shoulders, and they said, look, that's a good one right there. Let's go get him. And what was he? Train wreck, amen? Jesus, didn't, he didn't want us to, to, to come after him because he looked good. He wanted us to come after him because he is good. And you don't understand how he is good unless you have a relationship that establishes that. Now, I think I look better than my father at home. My mom thinks my father looks better than me. See, all those things are perception. I will rest on the fact that I still look better than my father. But, you know, we'll keep going on that one. But I'm just saying, we don't want to get caught up in the physical. So that's what's happening. The big church with all the cars. You got a preacher running around spouting everything but the truth, but yet some kind of way you're listening to this stuff. You're leading yourself. Not others lead. You're leading yourself because what you want to see. You identify with that because you've seen it. You want to be a part of that because you've seen it. What happened to this God that was so good all of a sudden? Now you got to turn your back on what you know to be the truth. My daddy said, look, I'm going to teach you the right way. Because the Bible says what? Train up a child and know where he should go. And when the end, he won't fall far, far from it. It's four brothers, me and my brothers. We're all still here by the grace of God. Two of us ended up in drug rehabs. Two of us didn't. But we were raised in the same house. Had mom and daddy. Had food. We didn't have all these societal um, ills that one might think. But it boils down to choices. Are you seeing? Are you seeing and hearing? Are you seeing and hearing and understanding? Because the Bible also says, it's amazing how the Bible covers itself with all these other things. Because it says, in all you're getting... Get what? It also tells us that we lack wisdom to ask for it. 
It's not no nebulous thing in the air that we can't get our hands on. James says if you want it, it's right here. But do we want that wisdom? My father has wisdom now, but that wisdom comes from his, his experience, his life experience. He's 81 now. And he's seen some things. He's seen some things even before television came on, if you get that one. Situations and circumstances and life experiences. His dad was a sharecropper. He knows about all those things. He's seen those things. Now I am the beneficiary of all of that knowledge. As you are too. Talk to your elderly, especially fathers and mothers. Talk to them. Record them. They got history that's going to die with them because the stuff that they know the real truth, you ain't going to get out of history book, amen? So let's do that. Let's, let's honor our parents. The Bible says that we should do that too, right? You remember that part right there? Honor your father and your mother that your day may be long. And not just long, fruitful, productive. You know, we're not just here to stay, but as long as we're here, we want to have a quality of life. And that quality of life comes from honoring God. And part of honoring God is honoring our parents. Amen. Now, Jesus, you know, he, he, he's still dealing with these guys. Because Jesus, is, he, he told them, look, the kingdom of God has come. And they start looking all around. I don't see no soldiers. I don't see no army. He was trying to explain to him. Like, you know, here again, they looked and they saw, but they didn't understand because they thought he was coming to take over and get Rome out of there. And they will be happy. Jesus is not coming for a physical takeover of this world. He doesn't need to do that. He is already Lord and Master. He wants us to develop a spiritual relationship with him like he has with the Father. So we can get out of here. Why would he want to come set up a kingdom to stay here? That's crazy. He came from heaven. He came from where eyes have not seen and ears have not heard. So you want him to stay out here where eyes have seen and ears have heard and nobody can get along and everybody's fighting? I don't want to be a part of that one. If that's the deal, I'm out. But he promises us, if we remain faithful, that there is a, a, a crown of righteousness for us. But that crown of righteousness for us then has to start with how we treat each other now. Amen. Let's keep moving. John 14, 15, and 16. Jesus is talking again. He says, simply said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Now, he didn't say if you think about it, if you get around to it. What did he say? Keep his commandments. Now, you notice God is, he's not mean here. He's not saying, you must keep my commandments. But he said, if you love me, it's predicated by love, Amen. The things that we do should be predicated by love. If you're going to go, like we've been talking about, you got to go in love. Because if you go with anything other than love, there was a story in the Bible. It was a demoniac. Came to the disciples. <laughs> Man told them what was going on. The disciples, okay, we're going to try to do this. He said all the disciples, long story short, he said all the disciples on the run. They went to, came to Jesus, and Jesus took the, the, the demon out of them, did he not? And the, did the disciples said, how in the world do you do that? He said, these things must come by prayer and fasting. Amen? So Jesus was giving them the examples. They supposed to be with Jesus. They weren't following the examples, but when it was time to, for them to, to um, actually do something for the cause of Christ, they couldn't do it because they were with Jesus. Hang on now. But they weren't with Jesus. You understand that? He says, if you love me, keep my commandments. And I will pray to who? The Father. If, if, if they, yeah. And now, look at what the Father does when Jesus prays to him. And he shall give you who? Another comforter. Jesus didn't give us the Holy Spirit. Who gave us the Holy Spirit? God gave us the Holy Spirit, did he not? But when did he give it to us? If we love him and we keep his commandments, he's already prayed to the Father now, and now we get the benefit of the Holy Spirit. 
So my question to you today is, how do you claim to have the Holy Spirit if you don't have love of Christ? It's impossible. You might have a spirit, but it's not the Holy Spirit. But I'm just saying, let us use the Bible, line upon line, precept by precept, to make, to make sense out of this thing. So we don't be running around here willy-nilly. And not only that, we need to be able to tell, each, tell other people how we got here, amen? Talking about a father's love. Out of love for Jesus, we keep the commandments. And Jesus, in turn, asked the Father to give us the comfort we need. A real father comforts his children because it's the godly thing to do, amen? The godly thing to do. And we have benefited, all of us who've had loving fathers and good fathers, we have benefited from that because although some of them might not be here anymore, don't those thoughts still comfort you sometimes? Those, those communications that you had? Now, for those of us who still have our fathers, you better appreciate it. Appreciate it. Because there's going to come a day where one of the two of you are not going to be here. And the other one is going to have to grieve. It's as simple as that. Now, the father gives good instruction. Let's go to Matthew 7, 13 through 14. He tells us to enter at the straight gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go thereat. But he says, look, that's not your, my dad told me, look, don't go where everybody else go. If, if everybody, everybody else go, go jump in the lake, you go, go jump in the lake. He said, boy, have some sense. So verse 14 is pretty much telling us that, because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life. And few there be that find that. God is trying to tell us that there is a way to get there, but we must yield to his knowledge, yield to his power. More than that, yield to his love, amen? Because he's not trying to do anything to hurt us. Everything God does, he wants to help us. John 17, 25 through 26. Now Jesus is, is getting, it's about time for Jesus to leave here. And he's talking to the father. He, he's, he's going over these things. He said, look, I came. And, and, and it wasn't quite what I expected, but I, I, I got through it. You know, I've been sweating this blood. And, and, and the challenges are great because these boys are hard-headed. But we knew that coming in. But now I got some more questions for you. I got some more, uh, I got some more things I need for you to do for a father. Y'all with me, John 17, 25 through 26? It says, O righteous father. The world has not known thee. Are we still in that same predicament today? But I have known thee, and these have known that thou hast sent me. He has already proclaimed to everybody he could who, G who God is. Amen? And I have de declared to them thy name, and I will declare it, that the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them, and I in them. So Jesus has gone from being us and them to now being one of us and he's advocating on our behalf to the Father. Do you see that? Do you see what he's done for us? The book of Hebrews says that he is in the heavenly sanctuary ever making intercession. But there's going to come a time, people. Probation is going to close. He has given us all the opportunities right now that we need. Jesus came from a heavenly throne and he took on a human body, and he arrived here with little fanfare. Only a couple shepherds knew about him. And he suffered the weight of sin for us. He fulfilled all the types. He confirmed the covenant by doing what no human could do. You remember back when, they, when Moses brought the, the covenant down, and they said, oh, you say he, we will do? They had broke that thing in about two weeks or whatever, but, but they couldn't find anyone else. So they had the sacrificial system, and, and it, um, it was the type of things to come. But the fact of the matter was there was no priest that could fulfill that could, could fulfill that um the um the requirement so Jesus had to come down on our behalf and his sacrifice was, was accepted and he is the only reason that we have an opportunity to go before the father amen amen good father sacrifice for the children they understand their responsibility to God first to take care of the child he put in their care mothers have their part to play but fathers have a tremendous impact as well. Involved dads have a direct impact on their children's future. I remember when my children were young. 
me and my wife, well, maybe with the exception of one field trip, one or the other of us was always on that field trip. One or the other of us was always going in that schoolroom. Teachers knew who I was, they knew who she was. There wasn't no question. We were always involved in our children's lives. And I'm not bragging or anything like that, but we all need to take that responsibility very seriously. Families are strengthened by supporting fathers. If you want your family to be strong, do what you can for your family. If you need to get a job, get a job. If you need to change your ways, change your ways. If you need to stop smoking or whatever you're doing, stop it. Tell the story. I was in the grocery store. Alicia was two months old. 22 months. She was two weeks old. I had about 10 bucks in my pocket. Had to make a choice. There we go. Had to buy a I, wanted to, I wanted to buy a beer. It was 30 years ago now. I wanted to buy a beer. But she needed that special Similac stuff. And one way or the other, I was going to be broke. I bought the milk. I never took another drink. The things that we do, I didn't need it in the first place. But the things that we do because we want our children to be successful. She's 30 years old now. And y'all know her. She made me stop drinking. I don't know. No. <laughs> Let's go home. But we got to remember when we're dealing with God's word. See, we got a problem with our eyesight. But we have to remember that all that glitter ain't gold. So all these erroneous ideals and stuff that you're following, you know, you got to look at for what, it, for what it really is. Go back to the Bereans. Understand what they did. They searched the scriptures. They actively acted on what they heard. So when they took it to heart, they knew it was the truth. They dig this. Gold is not always shiny on the outside. You find gold in the ground, it ain't just shining. You're going to have to get it out. First, you got to determine what it is, get it out. Then you got to clean it off. Then you got to polish it. That's why Jesus said, come get from me gold tried in the fire. That's what we need to be searching for. Come buy from me gold that's tried in the fire. But we're so busy running out the fool's gold. And I don't want to get started with Lot and Abraham and the fact that his eyes got him in a place. And, you know, he went over there. And next thing you know, he was, at, he was by Sodom. And then he was in Sodom. Amen. And then he was running for his life out of Sodom. Lost his wife. Then he ended up having sex with both his kids. That's not the, dad, that's not the daddy sermon you want to hear, but that's the reality if we're not careful. Amen. All that glitters is not gold. So let's stay focused on what Christ wants us to do. Yeah, we don't need music because guess what? There's going to come a time when the only songs you're going to have are the songs that you know in your heart. That might be the one that gets you through. It could be something like uh, this little light of mine. Whatever it takes to get you through, amen? Uh, they used to sing a little song at church just one more time. Glad to be in the number just one more time, amen? I think we get too caught up in all this technical stuff. I mean, it's wonderful to have. But in the big scheme of things, it's not going to get you where you need to be. It's the Father's love that's going to get us to where we need to be, amen? And we understand the Father's love as we draw closer to his son, Jesus. And once we, once we get there, there's no limit to how far we can go. Eyes have not seen, no ears heard, the wonderful things God the Father has in store for his people. Happy Sabbath.